So grateful to be here today. Um, love uh, the work of the Kansas Health Foundation, Kansas Leadership Center, and love this state um, and uh, the people that are here and that make up, uh, you know, the history of our state. And I personally am a fifth generation Kansas, uh, Kansan, raising sixth generation Kansans, and um, uh, uh, just very pleased to be here. And this panel um, gives us a lot of different looks of ways to get involved. So you've heard about how the state's changing and where it's headed, and you've heard about how important it is to get involved and how there's ways to get involved. Um, no matter what your background is, what your seat is, for yourself and how you invite other people to get involved. And so hopefully through this panel, you're going to get a picture, not only how some examples, how some of us have gotten involved in our communities, but also uh, hopefully it triggers things for you about ways that you can invite other people to get involved and shaping our uh, communities and our state um, and uh, the future for ourselves and our kids. So the idea for this will be that we, I'll ask some questions, and I've never done the dual role of facilitating and uh, being a panelist. So I'll try not to be the panelist who dominates, because then I'll have to have, be the facilitator and reprimand myself for talking too long. So <laughs> that'd be real awkward for you all to watch that. I'll try and save you from that. Ed O'Malley encouraged me just to think of myself as Oprah. Um, and the Kansas Health Foundation has agreed to buy all of you a new car. Um, thank you, Steve. All right. Best panel ever, right? We're done. Door prizes. Um, anyway, uh, so um, we're, I have a series of questions that we've talked about, um, and we'll, we'll uh, do questions for 30 or 45 minutes, and then we want to make sure that we create time at the end of this for you all to be able to ask questions if something gets stirred up. So if you have a question, write it down and make sure you save it because we'll create some space for that. Does that sound good? So I have some questions to start off with um, that are for all the panelists, and um, just jump in as you have an idea uh, as to how you'd want to answer it. But as you think about uh, reasons people tell you why they don't engage, so let's start there why people don't engage, um, what do you hear? And then what do you really think are the biggest reasons people don't engage? Who'd like to go first? I can go. Go for it, Margaret. Um, yes. In my particular case, um, well, number one, I've been a banker all of my adult life, but I became, I have always had a passion for achieving, goal setting and achieving so uh, anything such as community foundations uh, immediately captured my heart a long, long time ago. But uh, as a banker, you become very involved in communities and it's really vital. And as I continue in that total mission of banking and then I am very involved with the Community Foundation of Southwest Kansas in Dodge, located in Dodge City, uh, and I do asset development. And so that uh, consequently leads to uh, working with organizations, the nonprofits, all the kind of things that communities thrive on to be uh, a vibrant community. And it seems that a handful of people do 80% of the way of the work. And so as I talk to people and try to encourage them and inform them of the benefit of them being involved in making the community stronger. Um, we are needing to deal with younger generation people, the ones who have really created a lot of funds for foundations have been the older generation and they're departing from this world. And so the younger generation needs to be even more vibrant than the ones who came before. And so, what I encounter is um, the, this next generation of people, it's like they're very busy in their businesses, they're very busy with family activities, they really have never been invited to participate, and they, some of them think the same old people run the same old stuff, and so they don't feel like they fit in, and so forth, so my, observation says a community needs to create ways to ignite the fire in these young people so that they have a passion and a have a they have a passion for compassion 
because that's what we're all about as we reach out in services like the foundations. Thank you, Margaret. Adrian or Levant? Well, I think one of the reasons that people don't engage is because sometimes they say, I don't know. I didn't hear about it. Um, I wasn't uh, there to know that I could be involved. And, and so I, I think that we have to continue to look for uh, different ways of making sure that we're reaching out and that we are inviting uh, people to the table. Um, those that, that know me know that one of my mottos is, if you're not at the table, then you could very well be on the menu. Um, and that is one of the things that I do make sure that they understand um, when, when uh, during my tenure, uh, I was trying to make sure that uh, people were engaged. And yes, Margaret, that millennial age and that younger age and that, those are uh, some of the young people that we need to have at the table um, because it, uh, to me, made no sense that 60, 70, and 80 year olds were determining what the city is going to look like as the young people grow up. I didn't think that was very fair. So I think that we have to make sure and we have to be very inviting. And I'll just give one example of how I reached out. Um, there are young professionals that work here in Wichita and there are also the urban professionals. And uh, so one day I just said, I, I've had enough. I'm not hearing from this group. So I went to an urban professional meeting and my comment was, you need to be at the table. We're making decisions for your city. Um, and I'd love to have, have you at the table. And so lo and behold, we have had many people to put themselves in those positions. One of those being the Health and Wellness Coalition because a young lady was very involved in the health and the, at her workplace. And so she came to the Health and Wellness Coalition and has been very, very active. So I think that we have to show them that that's why they need to be engaged. We have to make sure that we reach out because we can't always sit and wait for people to come to us. Uh, but there have been opportunities as well that I have empowered, uh, I don't want to say my senior uh, group, but our well-seasoned group. So I, I've had opportunities to also empower uh, that particular group. So it's not knowing and not knowing how you will fit in. Adrian, anything you'd like to add? For me, I have to look at this through the lens of um, home, which is Wyandotte County. We are um, in the area that where most of that negative data comes from. Um, you name it, we got it. Um, high, high diabetes, cholesterol, cancer, people dying, economic, school district, you name it, plethora stuff. And so when I hear this question, or when you ask, ask people, why don't they engage? You hear two words, for what? Um, we don't even have a fresh produce grocery store. We've had four mayors that have come through promising a grocery store. And so people find that kind of idiotic and asinine. So now I'm starting to get mad already, so. <laughs> Go on and please. Let me focus on somebody. Let me, okay, they, right there. Um, we, it's, 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 it's crazy because people have been engaging for years in our part of Northeast Wyandotte County and for what purpose? And I think Mr. Lou was killing me when he's talking about those six points because I'm like, we don't have that, we don't have that, we don't have that, we don't have that, we don't have that. And when I got to the purpose part, I just had to stop and just breathe. So the exercise was good for me, thank you very much. The stretching was but people don't engage because there's no purpose behind it. Um, Irene said it yesterday, you know, it's kind of hard when, you know, you go to the meetings, you, 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 you march, you do all these different things and you get it, what you think engagement is. And so maybe, maybe true engagement, we don't know what that kind of engagement is. So, um, just Adrian, not. let me ask. So, when you, when you encounter for what, what do you say back? How do you encourage people over that hurdle? I, well, I, and I and I can only attribute it to, you know, my time here, uh, working at KLC and learning these competencies. 
um, there's a bigger purpose and we look at our kids, you know. Um, one of my mentors, Miss Marianne Flunder, she told me, she said, uh, Pastor, you know, I love you, right? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you gotta grow some balls. <laughs> Hope I didn't offend nobody right quick, but she said, y'all too nice. Write that down. All right. That's point number six, grow some balls. So, uh, number seven, I'm sorry. Um, she said, but engagement means a lot of time in a system like ours that you're going to have to be conflictual. You're going to have to raise enough hell to get people to see that there is a problem. And so uh, that's what I tell people. You know, we, we just got to get mad enough to say this is foolishness and it needs to stop and it needs to be a collaborative effort. That's great. Thank you all. Margaret, did you want to add something? Yes. Uh, there is uh, an illustration I would like to share with you. I'll keep it short. Uh, in uh, Dodge City, in our community foundation, <clears throat> our youngest donor is a nine-year-old little girl. <clears throat> and she, became, she came to us so serious. And she started her interest in reaching out, helping others by um, noticing that there were some neighborhood children who lived in quite a lot of poverty. And she took it upon herself, she told her mother, she's going to start having her mother help her bake cookies and she's gonna sell cookies so that she can uh, start a fund so she can distribute money to children who don't have much. And that she did. She, they baked dozens and dozens of cookies and that little Mariana, she um, came to us and she was ready to start her endowment fund. <laughs> and she did. She came and she sat at the table like uh, a tremendous diplomat and she was signing the documents and her parents were there and they added to her fund and every year she goes out and raises money to add to her fund and we make distributions for purposes of children. And she has kind of awakened people who uh, seem to think it's not anything they want to be interested in. And she's been invited to neighborhood communities to speak. And she loves it. That's wonderful. So I'll use that as a pivot here to another question, um, which is, uh, what are your thoughts about engaging young people? Doesn't have to be nine, can be older, but young people, and you mentioned that earlier, Levanta. Um, and do you have a story to share about engaging young people? What, what has that been like, and where do you see the importance of that? Um, engaging young people is, is very important to me. Um, I'm a 35-year educator, um, and it was all middle school. Um, so they, um, they are very pushy and very persuasive. Um, but uh, presently we have uh, a situation that's going on where we want to limit the city of Wichita to uh, four swimming pools uh, for the entire city of Wichita. But one of those swimming pools that's closing is in a very historic park. Um, and so for me, uh, I wanted to know, thank you for the music, um, I, <laughs> I wanted to know what do our young people think? So for me, it was a no-brainer to go into the schools and ask elementary students for one, and to ask middle school students, if you had the opportunity to swim, uh, would you go to McAdams Park? If not, why not? And so engaging young people at that age, whether I went to the elementary right across the street from where the swimming pool was, or I went to various other elementaries, and that's what I did, to ask them their reason for not going. But this also engages our young people, but by raising their hand to say, I would like to swim there, or I would like to be there, that's another teachable moment, because I was then teaching them the importance of voting and to the importance of having their voices be heard. So that's very, very important to me. So for me, going into the elementary school and the middle school is engaging them at a very young age, it's teaching them to vote, and it's teaching them the importance of having a voice. So that's how young I started. Um, that's a great question. We have, uh, 
I can say over the last three years, let me back up a little bit. I, I've always been engaged. My wife and I started as a youth pastor, coaching youth football, so we've always been engaged with kids. Um, there's a great book that says that um, young people should never allow their age to hinder them. It's called the Bible. So um, I, I look at that, and we've been just trying to engage young people in a, in a level where you know, your voice matters. So two, three times a year, we get to go to Wichita State. And we go through one week of what I call this grind of, of, of encouraging students to know their purpose. And it goes beyond the classroom. It goes beyond, I, I mean, it goes family and just community, the whole nine. And so for the last two years, I had a chance to work with a group of students at F.L. Schlegel High School who were seniors this year. And we introduced them to the KLC competencies. And they got engaged with us for a community development and economic development project for Wyandotte County. And so we got them engaged with Hallmark Cards. Um, we got them engaged with, uh, uh, in their marketing department. And people were just pouring into, into them about how to put together a presentation. They got to meet our city administrator and, and our, uh, our mayor. And eventually, they put a proposal together to, our, to the Wyandotte Economic Development Group to say this is why we need this project at Indian Springs. And just to sit back and watch those students um, engage adults who had some tough questions about uh, what's sustainability gonna look like? Why do you, uh, 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 where are these ideas coming from? And then finally one of them said, so why do you want this so bad? And I'll, I'll never forget Sean, he said, because I wanna come home. I want to come back to something. He said, this is my house. He said, this is my grandma's house. My sisters stay here. He said, y'all got to do something so that I have a reason to come back. Shut down the whole meeting. Drop the mic the whole night. <laughs> and uh, you just seeing that all young people need is a spark. That's all they need. And to be able to pat that hand in the back to say, you can do this, and we'll block for them, we'll fight for them, but they, they can do this stuff. They can do it. That's great. Margaret, anything you'd like to add? Well, yes. Um, I, we we're talking about using the word or the language of engaging in my world. And I have been to various uh, schools. The key thing to getting a community uh, excited in all of the things we're talking about, involvement and engagement, I call it relationship building. And you know, even these young people, the little Marianas, uh, we were so supportive. I, I give her money every Christmas for her fund. And we adults need to respond to these young people. But one avenue that opens a door to a lot of young people in our community is that our foundation has grown to a nice amount to where we have a generous amount of grants we can um, give each year. And the grants are going to organizations such as the Boy Scouts and uh, organizations where young people are involved. And we tell the directors who come in to pick up the checks that we want every child who's in that group to write a thank you letter to us and tell them what benefit that money is for their organization. We want them to start realizing that it's a, there comes a day when they can pay it back. And we want them to feel that the Community Foundation is a real leader in the community for every age group. Can I add something to that as well? You sure can. When you look at the historical data, movements happen through young people. Martin had Stokely. Martin was talking peace. Stokely had a pistol, right? Um, when you, Malcolm was a young man, right? When, and he went to Mecca and he came back different, you know, but he, they were pouring into young people. You know, uh, you, you might not understand the Black Panther movement, but what they were doing in that community for young people mm -hmm. 
getting them to see themselves in a different way. You may look at it from a political perspective, but when you look at it from a cultural perspective, they were pouring into young people to give them a sense of pride that we somehow, truth be told, I think we need to apologize to our, this, the, I'm not gonna say millennials, let's say our young adults. I, we've missed it. We've, we've missed pouring back those old traditions of what was poured into us, and so, if we, I think if we really, really want to see change happen, then we've got to realize that the change is happening behind us. And we have to be willing to pull them along and then move out of the way and let them do what they do best. So. I think that's a great point, yeah, Adrian. Just a little bit to that. Yeah, go ahead, Levanta. Um, because as, as we look at it, there are so many people who do think that our young people have no idea of what they're talking about. Just look at what happened recently with our young people from Highland Park and the young people who spoke up and spoke out against guns. And there's still so many people who say, oh, they have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, this too shall pass and blah, blah, blah. But we're not paying attention. And for me, I continue to say, keep telling your story. Uh, keep making your voices be heard. Um, when people tell me that it's not going to make any difference, I will tell you that in 1958, it made a difference here in the city of Wichita. Uh, just next door by the Ambassador Hotel, or that was a Dockham drugstore. That was where the very first civil rights sit-in took place in the country. No, it wasn't down south. It was Wichita, Kansas, then Oklahoma, and then down south. And that was a group of young NAACP students. They were not the adults. The adults may have helped them to practice how to react if certain circumstances happened. But it was led by a young man named Ron Walters and NAACP youth. Now tell me they didn't make a difference. Now we can all sit at the counter. Yeah, thank you, Levanta. And I'll, I'll add to that, I was a student body president in college, and one of the things I picked up on was every university committee, one of my roles was to appoint students to all of them. And so the university had in their mind that every committee that was making decisions about the university would have a student present in that, not only to provide a student perspective, but to also begin investing in them and giving them opportunities and things like that. And as I came back to Wichita, one thing I noticed uh, that our city and other uh, places you didn't necessarily have a seat that was spoken for for young people in those. And so when you think about your organizations, you think about your communities, um, it's a great thing to, to encourage um, a place uh, that's open to find some young people to sit, to give them uh, the experience, to give them a voice. Um, but what we find, the people like what you're talking about, is people get involved with younger folks. They're inspired. There's energy, and a lot, the reason a lot of these movements start with young people, it goes back to American Revolutionary War, French Revolution, I mean, all through history, young people help start movements of civic engagement, and part of that is they're young, they're hopeful, they're thinking 20, 30, 40 years out, and uh, they're not weighed down with a family and a mortgage yet, you know, uh, like, like a lot of us, and so they can put in the energy and time and passion, and so uh, a key part of any community that's gonna move forward is an engaged, uh, young group. So, so even at the conversation that the young people had with the mayor, uh, there was a seasoned member of our community that stood up and said blatantly, right to their face, we don't want anything at Indian Springs that brings young people. Mm. Told them straight out, you guys are dangerous to our community. I mean, this is the language that was being used. You all are dangerous. You have proven that you can't boom, 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 boom. And the room went quiet. And then an adult stood up and went to bat for young people. Another adult stood up and went to bat for that group. Another adult stood up and went to bat for those people, for the, for the young, for the students. And then the students stood up and went to bat for themselves. And it was amazing to hear the last, uh, uh, Carrie, um, she said, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but hopefully, she said, maybe if you and I can come together, maybe you will get to see that not all of us fit that, that, that character trait that you said. So, you know, there's, those, those, there's a lot of hurdles, but when, you know, you have seasoned people 
who, who are just afraid of young people, I'm talking about afraid of them, then you know, those are some of the challenges that we're going to have to help them overcome. That's a great story. Thank you. Another little thing that I can add to that as far as uh, young people in our community um, about uh, four years ago, our community foundation paid to bring Rachel's challenge to Dodge City. And 4,500 students uh, through different sessions had exposure to that tremendous uh, presentation. And it was after the, Colorado Com the Columbine shootings some years ago. And Rachel's challenge was one of the children who uh, lost her life. And her parents put that together. The young people who heard the message, they were spellbound. And we staff from the Community Foundation were present and welcomed them and said, if anyone has questions or whatever, and you would be surprised how many children I saw on the streets later thanked me that the foundation made that possible for them. They heard words of encouragement. And the recent thing we did also in Dodge City was we had a very uh, outstanding football, professional football player come to Dodge City and he gave a wonderful a presentation to, again to junior high on into high school and we again had a, over 1,000 uh, young people there and his message was tremendous and it was all about you can, you can do it and you have, you are the people who have the ability to become very strong and make a difference. That's great, and it does make a difference with young people when they have others, even though they may show that they have the energy and the, the uh, belief in themselves, but when older uh, folks come around them and say, hey, you can, I believe you, and I'll help, uh, the energy level ratchets up. So I'm gonna switch to another question. Um, with any kind of volunteer or community engagement campaign, fundraising effort, we tend to reach out to the usual suspects, right? We all can relate to that. The low-hanging fruit, the people that uh, get involved in everything, that we know they care about this issue and we can get them in. But we all, I would imagine, since we showed up here, understand the importance of getting um, the uh, beyond the, the usual voices to engage others. And so <clears throat> what advice can you give to this group um, about successes you've found in getting beyond the usual suspects um, as you're trying to, to build a coalition? Oh, uh, just in the matter of saving time, I'll jump in. Go for it. <laughs> um, again, I will continue to stay with the idea of, it starts with building relationships, and uh, John is exactly right. You know, whenever you think in terms of advancing forward, whether it's increasing the volume of funds in your foundation or whatever organization you are, then you immediately think of the ones who have been very generous in the past and you want to just keep inviting them to participate. And uh, then you need to reach out to new people. But it all stems around relationship building. And I have found and I have learned that it takes about 90% of your time to build a strong relationship so those people have trust and confidence and you win their heart. And after you have that relationship in place, the rest of it, the remaining 10% is easy. They get it. And then you can march forward and you have a success story. And there's much more I can say about that. But, and how do you build relationships? I think for those of us who are in these strategic places where we reach out to people, in, in my world, I go to community activities and events, carry my business cards, and I make it a point to meet new people at all of those events, and I ask for business cards. I try to get some information about them. You know the old saying, they really don't care how much you know after they know how much you care. And so you engage and get it personalized and then you keep them in contact. You just don't say, uh, uh, give it a howdy doody thing at the 
event that you're attending, but you stay uh, in contact, sending them bits and pieces of information, and it's amazing how they will migrate to you, and they have felt that they have a rapport, and they trust you, and they want more information, and it goes a long, long way. Thank you. Lanta, Adrian? Um, I'll, I'll take that. Um, one of the strategies, well, there's so many strategies. And right now, I think technology is it. Um, technology reaches a certain age, um, whether it's on Facebook, uh, to keep uh, the community informed of what's going on, uh, what meetings are going on. This is going on. There's Zumba in the park going on right now, and your community might want to get there. Um, and so things like Facebook. Um, and next door, we have a program that's called Next Door, and that's where a neighborhood association can uh, just talk to other people in their neighborhood association areas. Neighborhood associations is one of the places that I go and went on a regular basis, making sure that I was connecting to as many uh, people in the community as possible, so getting out to neighborhood associations. Um, we had what's called a District 1 breakfast. And I, I must say that the council member that is now in District 1, uh, Brandon Johnson, continues that district breakfast and moves it around town so that we hear different voices. He also continues the listening sessions of uh, talking to youth. And, and I'm so happy and so proud of the things that he has done and continues to do. Um, but making sure that um, the district breakfast was another opportunity. So I reached a totally different group of people that would come to the breakfast uh, once a month so that they could have their voices be heard. Uh, National Night Out, getting out and having fun uh, with the neighbors in their communities and uh, having dialogue there. We have what's called district advisory boards. They advise the council member. Uh, there are so many zoning issues that come up and uh, you have a group of people that are the peers of that community and they sit at the table and they advise the council member. Uh, we think that this is going on and this is good. Uh, we have some things that are going on right now at place 21st and Oliver where a community would rather not have a retail or a commercial corner. Uh, and so you have the neighbors who come to the district advisory board and say, this is why we don't want it. Uh, it's very controversial right now, but that district advisory board allows a voice to be heard. We have neighborhood cleanups, and there's a great opportunity to have dialogue with people as we're cleaning up their neighborhoods and helping. Uh, impact meetings. Impact meetings uh, is a situation where something has happened in a particular neighborhood. Perhaps there's been shots fired. Perhaps we have cars broken into. We rope off that area and nobody comes in, but the neighbors come out into the middle of the street and we have a conversation. We say, this is what happened in your neighborhood. It probably did not pertain to you, but we want you to know what happened in your neighborhood, why those shots were fired. I would attend every single impact meeting if I could, because that was another opportunity to impact people who may not come to meetings, but who do want to know what's going on in their neighborhoods. Um, empowering people. Uh, for me, reaching to my well-seasoned community sometimes was a little harder. Getting them to get involved was a little harder. But I can remember one circumstance where it was a, a community, and uh, was it full of blight? Yes. But that was their home. That was their area that they were proud of. And somebody was setting up a business in their community by putting tires all in the front yard and selling tires from this business, and it was a residential house. And so an elderly couple called me, and I said, do you feel comfortable taking pictures? And uh, the lady said, well, yes. And I said, take a picture, please, and take it over to Atwater or send it to me. They were so happy to be able to contribute to taking that out of their community. Uh, they wanted to keep taking pictures. We've got tall grass over here. You want me to go take some pictures? <laughs> uh, but that is empowering people to say, you make a difference and you can help in your neighborhood. So there are so many ways. Going to the Ministerial League, which is a league of ministers, visiting our churches, getting our churches and our pastors involved in making those decisions or interacting. Uh, social organizations, whether for me it's the Divine Nine, uh, which is uh, your, uh, your 
sororities, your fraternities, uh, getting everybody engaged. And so I continue to think of ways in order to get people engaged. But those are just some of the strategies that, that I've engaged in. That's great, Levanta. Thank you. Adrian, what would you like to add? Well, this is a shameless plug, but for those who haven't been to KLC, I said that'd be first. Um, <laughs> Um, I have learned, and there are many of us back home who have learned and are continuing to learn this, this process of adaptive thinking, uh, how that rolls over into adaptive leadership, and just looking at our challenges from a balcony perspective and just realizing, you know, we've been trying to fix these things with these technical fixes, and I'm going to use, since we've been here longer than five minutes, we're family now, so I'm going to use a word like ain't. It ain't working, right? So... Uh, one of the strategies is we're, we're developing and, and putting together our KCK alumni group. We have a group called the CHC Community Health Coalition, which is the heat cab. And uh, uh, we've been really, really um, determined to, with the majority of the people who have come through KLC, uh, using the principles to get some things done. And so there's been this huge voter registration drive that has happened that is beginning to happen here in, in, in Wyandotte County. Um, just had a conversation with my good friend Irene. We're, we're, we, we, our community, my neighborhood now, which used to be about 80, 20, is now about 50, 40, African American, Hispanic. And so when we talk about, like he said, like he said, you know, Sundays are the most segregated days of the week. You know, that's crazy if we're gonna call ourselves the church. And I'm gonna leave that alone, because that's another conversation. But if, if, if the church isn't reaching out to the to the community that has been placed in, then the question has to be, are you really the church? So being able to talk across cultural differences and you know, uh, 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 for the purpose of what scripture tells us to do is to take the gospel to the north, south, east, and west. Um, being able to sit at the table, this is probably the biggest one, is to sit at the table and recognize what a faction is and not be angry because that faction has different values and loyalties than you do, and being able to recognize what their losses could be for even being at that table. That's huge. The, the, the strategy of recognizing in myself and others, you know, what do I have to risk losing in order for progress to be made? Nobody talks about that. Nobody, that question had never been asked to me as an adult till I got here. And so when you take that to a community that, who, that believes that for 400 years we've been losing every day. We've been losing since we've been shipped over here. We didn't have to take that boat trip, right? And now you're asking me, do I don't want to risk losing to make progress? That's, I mean, the heat automatically goes up in the room, but when you can get people into a productive zone, I'm using all kind of KLC stuff. I must be learning stuff. <laughs> so, but if, when we can get people to strategize differently from a perspective of big picture, like we've been here in the last, yesterday and today, that, that seems to be working. It's slower, it's more frustrating, and so the last strategy I would say is just managing yourself through it. Because we want it fixed yesterday. I'm, I want a grocery store. You know, my grandkids, my son moved into the neighborhood I grew up in. It's not the same neighborhood. You know, I want my grandkids to be able to go outside and not have mom on the porch, you know, worrying about, where's that poke, where's that, where's that, where's that about? You know, so being able to manage yourself is a different strategy when you're talking about challenges that are so overwhelming. So, um, and, 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 and that causes engagement with other voices. It causes you to have to talk to people that you, on Facebook, can't stand. Oh, that's just me, right? Is that, <laughs> you know you inbox folks. Y'all know y'all be, you know, those parking lot conversations. But to be, to be able to, to talk to people and be like, man, they, we all want the same thing. We really do. And so um, just getting people to the table is a success. I mean, it's so, so uh, you know, sec uh, celebrating those small poops, that's what we call them. You know, hopefully get to the big bang. And I've also found, you know, as the heat starts to rise in the room like that, that a bow tie can be quite disarming. <laughs> so you've got that going for you too. I don't know, in my, in my context, it could be, I don't know. <laughs> it might be the opposite. I think you know everything because you got a bow tie on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I'd add on, uh, as far as finding the beyond the usual suspects and voices is um, that it, there's not a path of least resistance on that. 
and you shouldn't wait until the moment where you need to go find those people. The real work in that is done in the in-between times, and there's a couple ways to do it, and, and one is being curious about other people um, and getting to know them, uh, people that aren't like you, um, and when you have opportunities and invitations uh, to get to know people that aren't in your circle, you've got to jump on it. It's a part of leading in a community is forming those relationships like Margaret talked about where there's trust as a foundation so that when there's time, it's time to activate around something, the network's already formed. And then as there's a trusted relationship, that can help you reach into other communities through that relationship. Um, but uh, in any relationship, like you said, also you start to understand other people's perspectives and their needs, and you can work together uh, for a better coalition. Uh, but it also is important, and it's another thing I learned in college, you just need to show up, right? Show up at places where there aren't people like you. Uh, show that, that they're worth your time and your energy um, and get to know their culture and what it's all about. And even though you're a fish out of water in that uh, moment, that's where friendships are formed and trust is gained. And so that'd be just two things I'd add. So we're running up uh, with about 15 minutes left for this panel. And I have some other questions I can ask, but I want to stop right now and see what questions that you all may have from the audience right now. Uh, for anybody, you can direct it to the panel itself or any one of us individually. Um, and we'd be happy to talk about that. Does anybody have a question? Well, guess what? I have another question. So while you're thinking about that, um, let me ask this question. This is one of, the, one of the ones I was anxious to hear you all answer. Um, would you say your work has been easy? And if not, why do you continue? Let me start. <laughs> I'm going to read you. This is, this is the reason why I do what I do. This is a report from the, it was a heat report from the Kerwin Institute um, talking about the inequality in Wyandotte County. This was a note um, written from a leader in Wyandotte County in 1939. So this is the data that we've been using. It says um, this one particular area is a large rambling area that's occupied almost entirely by Negroes. There being a smattering or smittering of whites between 5th and 7th Streets and in the other parts of the outer fringe at the east and west. The ground is rolling to hilly with uh, several draws and gullies, houses old and poorly kept as in all Negro areas. It is spotty there be, uh, between 5th and 7th Streets from State North to Freeman. Some good houses occupied largely by white people with values depressed and sales very poor due to the Negro influence and continued infiltration. Okay. <sighs> Between Washington and Oakland, <clears throat> 11th to 13th streets, is a small section of good houses, several of which cost above 10,000, occupied by the higher income Negro. Between Stewart and Cleveland from 3rd to 7th Street, the houses are a much better grade than those found throughout the colored portions of the area, excepting the spot just mentioned above. The area is adequately served in the matters of schools, transportation, and utilities. Negroes in this large area yield important political influence um, as a wider latitude of freedom than is enjoyed by Negroes on the Missouri side. As a whole, it is a spotty section, a typical Negro area with very little pride of ownership evident. Demand for property has been slow with the great majority of houses in the cheaper class, very few selling above $3,000. This report literally talks about the redlining of Wyandotte County. And when I got this, I, I've, been, I, I've, I've never been kicked in the gut till I read that. Because it says, you talk about is the work easy? No. Because this report says that <clears throat> if you live east of 635, it's highly probable that 20 years of your life has been cut due to lead-based poisoning, which is where I stay. So because of redlining and because of the literal institutionalized racism that was established 
in Wyandotte County in the 30s, the data that you read about Wyandotte County in 2017, 2018, that's why we do the work. So is it easy? No. But we have a purpose to change this. And it matters that everything that you have heard about, I think Irene said it best, we, we need help. You know, we, we get tired of asking for money. I'm, I hate asking for money. I hate, I hate coming to folks who don't look like me. It looks like a handout. But it's not a handout. Then show me, show me how to, show us how to get there. Show, uh, act, open doors. Show us, because we're not at those tables of influence like that. Because people are dying in Wyandotte County. People are dying in the urban core. And so, um, is it easy work? No, but it, it matters. And so, my, like Ms. Flunder said, you know, we're, we're trying to grow some. And um, we're going to continue to do the work until this foolishness is eradicated. Thank you, Adrian. Levanta? Um, I would say the same thing. Um, is the work easy? Uh, no. Uh, one of the first things that I did as a council member was walk to a certain district in a certain area um, in the district that, that I serve. And as I knocked on doors and as I was filling out information and as we com had conversation uh, with the people in the area, uh, there's one thing that stuck out uh, for me and it's probably something I will never ever forget. A and that gentleman said, oh, why are you guys here? Uh, we thought the city forgot we lived here. That to this day is something I will never forget. Someone saying, we thought the city forgot that we lived here. All that community wanted was the same quality of life that is available for everybody else. That's all that the community wants. And, and right now, uh, we still have those situations. Had not an organization come in and started building in that particular er area, I, I don't know how I would have been able to help rebuild that community. Uh, I was a council member for one of the oldest districts in the city, and the houses that were there have been left by adults. Uh, mom, dad left and, and passed away, and the house is there, and nobody wants it. So those houses become vacant, they become blighted, they become a danger in the community, and so we have someone helping. Why do we continue what we do? Because you continue to want to make that difference. Do we always do it? Absolutely not. Right now, the city of Wichita is going through some training and going through some eye-opening opportunities by talking about race, equity, and leadership. I think every city should have that opportunity to talk about those situations so that when situations occur, leaders should know how to react. And that is one of the things that we were going through. It comes out of the National League of Cities. And so what my, my hope is, is that we go to each place and incorporate and help people to understand race, equity, and leadership is different in each city. But it provides the quality of life that is decent for all. And that's what we have to do. And so you ask, why do we continue? Because one day, it will make a difference. As Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King said, one day we'll get there. I'm still saying that. One day we'll get there. We're not there yet. So that's why I continue to do what I do. Thank you, Levanta. Margaret? Yes. Um, do, is it easy? No. But let me tell you, and I would encourage each one of you here today, um, for me, it is a thrill to go out and talk to people, and even if I've never met them before, because uh, I do have a passion for what I do, and no, it's not easy, perhaps, but when you love what you do, and you see the good that it can do, you don't even think about what it is that you're challenged with. And so, for each one of you, and perhaps you're already there, if you don't already have a passion and love the idea, I love doing cold calls. And some people just cringe. And I say, oh, no, not I. Because, because each one of you in this room have a wonderful, wonderful 
thing to profess and a wonderful thing to share. And that's the good news of what you're all about. And when you have good news to share, it becomes tremendously encouraging and enthusiastically wonderful for you. Well, while you're getting yours on, let me go there. Do, you, do your thing. <laughs> do your thing. I was slow. <laughs> um, one of the other things, and, and Margaret, I, I, I thank you for saying that. You, you have to love what you do. And I guess I love it because for 35 years, I taught middle school. And some say, were you crazy? And I said, <laughs> no, I love it. If those kids are going to be in a gang, be in my gang. Be in my gang. Um, and so even with being on city council, I loved it. I, I loved it. I loved the challenge. I loved everything about it. But in many cases, labels affect us. Labels, whether it's in school, that child wears a label because, oh, you're a troublemaker. Oh, you did this, you did that. You're probably going to do it for the rest of your life. So you're labeled. The same thing with our city and some of the components in some of the areas that we talk about. We label things. Oh, don't ride the transit bus. That's for poor people. That's for homeless. That's for this. That's for that. So you don't ride the city bus. And the same thing for areas of town. Oh, 67214, let me tell you. Um, uh, low, low home ownership, uh, high unemployment, this and that. And people would always ask me, why do you say District 1 is the best district in the city? I will continue to say that because I want young people to know that it's OK where they live. And that was always very important. So why do we do it? Another reason is we love making a difference, and we love what we do. Okay. Two things. One, um, I, I would hope that you know, after listening to what you've heard us say, that it really doesn't matter if you're urban, suburban, or rural. Mm -hmm. You do it because you love it. That's right. You do it, uh, Malcolm X said, a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. And I think we've been falling for foolishness too long. And so this goes back to that question that says, uh, what are you willing to risk losing in order to see progress? And lastly, I'll say this. That was a perfect setup. My son was six years old, and he went to school. And my oldest boy, so he came home, and my wife said, so how was school today? He said, OK. So what'd you do today? Recess. <laughs> she said, so what color's your teacher? He said, pink. <laughs> I want y'all to catch what I just said. So I, I, first of all, I tell people, like the young lady said yesterday, I'm not a minority. I don't allow you to label me. I'm not a minority. Two, I'm not black. This is black. Truth be told, you ain't white. You don't look like that. <laughs> and the church said amen, amen, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> if we can get rid of the labels and just see, and an old head told me this, and I'm going to shut my, we call it, I'm going to shut my north south when I say this, and a preacher can't do that. He says, if we can just see humans, human beings as they are, I say, okay, what are you saying? He said, humans being. Humans being what? Human. We just might get a little further today than we were yesterday. Beautiful. So, Christy, I'll let you call it. We're coming up on 1130. Would you still like to have time for a couple questions here? You ready for me to close it up? One burning question out there? Yes. I think Levant is doing the Zumba after this. <laughs> Which park is that? That was my profession. <laughs> I don't know it's a, if it's about burning, but I think it's a continued conversation. You raised um, the a point about we have to discuss race. Um, so I think the hardest thing is coming to a table, uh, and uh, I wouldn't say the hardest, I think it's easy for me to come to a table and begin to have that conversation. The hardest thing is to be shut down. In particular, shut down because you're tired of hearing it. That wasn't my generation that did that to you. We're changed. We don't have those policies anymore. Racism doesn't exist. 
So the tough part is not starting the conversation. The tough part is continuing the conversation, or at least getting it beyond the start. So I guess what I would ask the panel, um, I think when you talk about equity and you talk about health, race, and, and I, everywhere I go, plays a part in that. How do you forge the discussion? You know, that, and that exactly is what we're doing now, is going through with it. As you look at equity, I would ask you to look at equity by three people trying to watch a ball game, and they're on the other side of the fence, and the lower part of the fence is, is blocked out. So um, there's a real tall person, that's, that's me. Um, I'm able to look over the fence. I, I can see it. Um, but yet and still, there are two people that are shorter than myself who can't see it. And so when I think about equity, then it's giving them a box or it's giving them a step stool so that they are able to see that that's equity. Then we're all able to see that at the same time. And, and you're exactly right. A race is still hard to talk about. Um, but if you don't talk about it, then it never gets done. And so that's where we're seeing as far as the race and leadership. Uh, what happened in Ferguson happened so fast that those leaders were not prepared for it. Um, and so we're talking about right now, have those police conversations and have those staff conversations so that we know how to approach them at, at a later time. Um, I had a young man who just experienced racism uh, last week, and this was a child, and I'm very upset still about it um, because he was working at a large event, um, and um, he went in to pick up his dinner because he thought uh, they were supposed to go eat dinner uh, in this particular place. Uh, that young man wa was an uh, African-American young man, uh, went to get his dinner or to sit down and eat dinner, and he was told, you can't eat here. Oh my God, that hurt. Um, but he was told, you can't eat here. Um, and then she said, okay, but if you wanna eat, you'll have to take it out. My God, when I heard this story, it took me back to 1958, and I wanna sit at the counter right down the street here and sit down and eat my hamburger and Coke, but I have to take mine out of that particular area. So our kids still need to be learning about racism because this hurt this child who went home and told his mom, mom, I couldn't eat. And she told me that the room was full of white and I was the only black who came in and tried to sit down and eat and he could not eat. So it still exists. We have to have the conversations. We have to have some uncomfortable feelings, but we all have to have the conversation. Um, you know, I think of black girls do bike. That's what they call themselves, black girls do bike. They bicycle just like everybody else does. But because there's not an awful lot of African Americans that you see on bikes, they said, let me call it out, black girls do bike. And it's okay, but we have to continue the conversation no matter how uncomfortable we feel. We have to have the conversation, if not for us, for the sake of that generation that's coming up right behind us. We have to talk about it. Yeah, and we're, we're out of time. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know you had that one, Pastor. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm getting this, the signal, and I want to honor all that. But thank you all for being here and your interest. I want to thank this panel. A round of applause. Uh.